I live my life uh, with the philosophy or uh, with the belief of three M's, okay? No matter the future will come, I will live my life with moderation, which means the, the wisdom of balancing between me, myself, and other life. The second M is uh, mindful. Okay, I, I, before I make any decision, I have to think through. I have to be conscious about the, the impact, about the, the karma. That's why in addition to my talk on the sufficiency economy, I always have a talk on the karma marketing because uh, there's something that can either create a positive footprint or positive footprint. Karma is a footprint, right? So I always mindful. I always think about if I do this, what's going to be uh, the impact, not just the outcome, what's going to be the impact of my action. And the last one, whatever I do, I have to make sure that it's meaningful. Because uh, if there is no use, if they cannot be uh, beneficial to our life, it's just the action. Dr. Siri Kool Nui Lao Kai Kool is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Nui is a brand strategist and sustainability advisor, the brand being consultant, country director. Sustainable Brands Thailand founder and director of the creator Por Lao D. And she'll correct me if I say this wrong. <laughs> Nui began her career in brand marketing in the creative area and later progressed to the strategic side of the business. She received her bachelor's degree in mass communications from Chua Long Corn University, master's degree in advertising management from University of Texas in Austin, Texas, and PhD in human resource development from International Program of Victoria University, Australia, and Bur Burapa University, Thailand. After working for the Global Network for close to 20 years, Siri Kool founded her own consulting firm with a mission to be a small but comp competent strategic advisory company aiming to work with Thai clients who truly believe in sustainable branding with systematic methodology. Her approach to develop and design brand strategy is based on the sufficiency economy philosophy and practice she passionately advocates. With a background ranging from communication and management to sustainable development, in addition to her own unique combination of creating flair and strategic thinking. thinking. Nui is one of a kind consultants who can provide strategic and holistic recommendations that are sensible and practical for each client's needs. Her strengths lies in comp compelling brand strategy development, brand model and brand architecture, as well as corporate social responsibility. She has been representing sustainable brands in Thailand since 2006 and successfully uh, commenced the conference among the business circle for more than five years. Additionally, she founded the Creator Poor Law D program aimed at strengthening immune, uh, immunity among young entrepreneurs through sufficiency economy philosophy. Nui is a wonderful speaker sought after all over the world on uh, branding and sustainability subjects. She has been invited as a key speaker in several countries. Her speech on karma marketing and moderation and sustainable development have admired and have been admired and are referenced among those who practice business with compassion. Nui, boy, that is a long biography 
and I know I could say a thousand more things, but welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ So、It's good, good that you still remember some Thai. Yeah, a little bit of Thai, so I didn't mess anything up too too much, right? Only one thing: you have to pronounce the the project names like Paul Laudi. Paul Laudi. Paul. Paul Laudi. Laudi. It means enough is good. Wonderful. So that sufficiency.、Um, Philosophy comes from King Ram the Ninth, and maybe that's a good starting point as well. I I I would like to kind of maybe can you tell me a little bit how you came upon it, how you decided this, how it's developed into your entire life's mission and work. I think um I'm I'm just like a people in the. Baby boomer generation, we were born to be like a professional employee. So I has been working in the big corporation for almost、uh, the whole of my career, and up until the certain point that I feel like uh, being a CEO, being a MD. But when I came back home, I never feel fulfilled. I always、um, get moody to the people around me. I have only the figure in my head that I have to make more billing for my boss, and I feel like、uh, this life is not healthy. I have to stop it. I feel like、uh, this is enough for me, and and by that time, I I think it's like、uh, many people when you want to change or transform yourself, you search for something that you can. Uh, hang on to, so I came across、uh, one book that、uh, called sufficiency economy philosophy. Okay, and the term sufficiency in Thai、uh, we pronounce "ho piang." Okay, "ho piang"、uh, for Thai people, we we feel like、uh, oh, this is、uh, represent how I felt right now that I feel like、uh, this enough. So I start to to read it. Just to、uh, get familiar with the principle, and the more I I read through it, I feel like、uh, I can just follow the, his、uh, teaching, my my king's teaching, just like a framework for my decision making in anything. So it gave me a swing to quit my job and、uh, start my new chapter in life because、uh, the principle of the Sufficiency economy、uh, allow me to to give you more detail. It's a、uh, comprised with、uh, three factors and two condition. The king said that if you want to get into the sound decision, you need to consider three factors. The first factor is about yourself. You have to to really know yourself, so you know your own condition. The second one he called reasonableness. Everything should have a reason, and not only the reason of doing. You have to understand the impact that your action, or in the Buddhism we call karma, will create. So every cause has a has an impact. Okay, and the third factor is about in Thai word we call it. Pum pum gan, pum pum gan. In English, is more like a self immunity.、Uh, all of these are more like a internal factor. You really have to consider all of these things before you make a decision. But the king said that that's not enough. You, in addition to knowing yourself, you have to know the surrounding, the external surrounding. So he said that the condition about knowledge is also very critical. We really have to know what's going on in the in the context that you try to make a decision. But like you know,、uh, knowledge is very powerful. It's like any other thing in life, like technology, like、uh, any power. If you use it without any ethic, 
you can use it to take advantage or ruin other people. So the second condition that has to be incorporated into the decision making is about ethic. So all of these things is what composed to be what we call sufficiency economy philosophy. And actually, in, in the nutshell, uh, this philosophy is developed based on the thinking of Buddhism, the moderation. And when you're talking about moderation, it's not like uh, in the middle of anything because uh, in the translation, people say that moderation means the middle path, but it doesn't mean that the right has to be equal to the left but moderation is more like a wisdom of balancing. That's why we call philosophy. So I, I feel like uh, this is the thing that give me a framework, give me uh, something that I can have a courage to transform myself. So I quit my job and start my own uh, branding consultant. And uh, I even use the sufficiency economy as a framework to develop brands to my clients. So it's not just something that more like a philosophy that you think is, it can, can also function as a methodology. That's how I, I get into the, the wisdom of the moderation derived from sufficiency economy philosophy. Beautiful. Thank you so much. The reason I wanted to dive right into that in the beginning of our call is not only because it's discussed in your biography, but it ties closely to King Ram and, and, and the Ninth and also many things that we're going to discuss throughout our talk today through our dialogue and discussion that we're going to bring that up and I want to make sure everybody has a good foundation of what it is and how it ties into some other things that we, we discussed. Um, first and foremost, I want to update my, my listeners and, and let them know how we know each other. We met in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, you're in Thailand now. Uh, um, you're going to have to tell me the, the name of the city where you're at or roughly the area that you're at. We're, right now? Yes. Right now, I'm in uh, Khao Yai. Khao Yai is like uh, north of, of at like uh, two hours and a half drive from Bangkok Very is nice. one of the area that has the the best ozone in Thailand and it's probably probably one among seven in the world Wonderful. the the air the condition still very good this is great. my shelter during the covid actually <laughs> great i love that um and we met originally it was probably almost, was it three years or two years ago? Yeah, um, at the TMA conference. Yeah, at the TMA, Thailand Management Association conference. And we were both speakers. Um, uh, you spoke uh, after me and gave the most wonderful, eloquent talk. And everybody was a standing ovation and uh, loving what you had to say because of your passion. And you also touched on, um, I believe, the sufficiency economy philosophy at that time as well. And then over the time, our, our, our paths have crossed, obviously, with sustainable brands and other Thailand Management Association talks. And, and you have blessed my life by showing me wonderful uh, places in Thailand. We, we did the sustainable brands, um, Chanta Boon, Chanta Buri. We did uh, a sustainable brands, Chum Pong. First. Chum we went to Chum was first. Uh, this last one was Chantaburi and uh, Chum Pong was first and we went to the Crab Bank and had wonderful food, fabulous experiences, but uh, more so it was uh, this familiar family uh, feeling very hospitable, large event, helping locals, regional communities, university, a lot of youth, a lot of uh, indigenous local people who are there um, trying to build up their communities, build up the way they produce and make food, the way they see environment and recycling and things. So um, it was just a 
fabulous, fabulous, beautiful time. And I, I thank you. And I'm so glad that we can meet here on uh, Zoom and have, have a podcast and discuss some things. I would like to, um, because you've been on this path and journey, not only the sufficiency economy philosophy, but sustainability, corporate social responsibility, brand be being, you know, the, the responsibility and ethics of brands. You mentioned it. Uh, and, and your description and kind of about where you've gone. How has that helped you from uh, in, in your life during this time of a lockdown of a pandemic? Has it given you any resilience or helped you in any way to weather this horrible storm? Can you kind of give us an update of where we are till, till now and what, what that's looked like for you? I think the, the pandemic, let it show everyone, especially among my people who believe in sufficiency economy philosophy, that one of the factors uh, that the king uh, said about uh, immunity is very important. Actually, uh, when we transform or translate self-immunity to the business practice, it's about risk management, right? So uh, during the pandemic, most of my uh, quality people, I mean the, the young entrepreneur or even my uh, SME clients who practice uh, sufficiency are the ones who support the society. Can you believe it? Because uh, oh, yes. they, they conduct business with a sense of prudence, they have a good saving, they, they never over invest, they, they, they have something that they prepare for uncertainty. So during the, the, the COVID, the, the big issue that everyone is facing is about food, right? Because uh, you were locked out, supermarket were closed, you cannot uh, go out anyway. But you know what? I have a lot of food sent to me from my people. This doesn't mean that, okay, I'm, I'm the center of uh, that attention. But uh, because uh, those people, we were, teach, we were taught about sharing. So once we recognize that uh, people in the network, people that uh, we know in our circle could have some issue in food, we start to, to, to send it out. So uh, this really proved that during the any crisis, the business that practice sufficiency, business who has sense of self-immunity could be the one who has a better chance to, to get over, has a better opportunity to support the society, which you probably call it resilience. Yeah. So, so I nearly confirmed to myself that what I believe and what I've been teaching to my students, what I share with my clients about uh, moderation, about the sufficiency, it's really pay off, especially in the in the crisis. Yeah, I, I, you know, I follow you online on social media as well, and, and I've seen and, and I know that somehow over the years, uh, through this way of living, through through your thoughts on uh, circular economy and sustainability, sufficiency, sharing economy, things like that, that. <clears throat> whether you call it resilience or not, or immunity, or um, you, you are put in a better place in those of your clients and all those around you that you're speaking with your network, which is fairly large, I, I have to say that, we're in a place that they could then help those who were less fortunate, who were maybe not in a position to have that resilience because they're maybe at a different poverty level or, their circumstances couldn't um, be such that, that they could have even that the, the basic sufficiency. So now there's a net, network of people supporting them. 
The other events that we were at and, and did uh, that I participated in that you put on were really all based around sustainability, food, uh, and how how that happens. You teach women uh, in one of the largest prisons in, in Thailand uh, how to cook food. There's a, a, a network of uh, chefs, Michelin star chefs to organic chefs to uh, all sorts of different types of chefs. And I saw, you know, they were delivering packaging meals and providing, uh, e even some who weren't doing food were providing masks and, and other opportunities and, and, and things to help people during this time to make sure things were okay, which is um, the strength of your network. But maybe you could tell us about, you know, I, I believe the number of meals that were delivered and that were are, is just enormous, is numerous every single day in that network. I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit more insights or give us some wisdoms on that. Okay. Uh, before I go to how many boxes or how many packages, let me tell you the original of this project, okay? I'm a brand consultant, so I believe in the power of branding. And every time that uh, I arrange or conduct or organize the, the sustainable brand conference, I always aim for the action oriented. I don't want people or speaker or even you when you come to the conference to just come and talk. I want you to create impact to the communities that I, I arrange, okay? And the time that we have a SB in Chumpon, the theme is about food, okay? Because uh, Thailand is a uh, position as a uh, kitchen of the world. And we have a uh, very rich in all kinds of uh, food resources. So I want to, to uh, focus on the sustainable food in the SB. But I don't want just a big brand to come and just share the practice. And just say uh, they're sorry, how, what is their CSR policy, such and such. I want the brands to come and listen to the community about what they want from the brand. Because I believe that when we say a sustainable brand, it doesn't mean brand has to create it owns sustainability but brand has a role to create sustainability for the society so brands should act like a platform to uh, collaborate every single player to to change the the system okay so we we start the project in chumpon i have uh, several ships come to a SB conference in Chumpon, if you recall. And after I talk to them, I feel like uh, actually they can do more than just uh, help me look after the seafood supply chain or the food supply chain. Every single chef are the key influencer. If they can use their personal brand impact to create something positive, they can help a lot of people in the society. That, that's how I come up with the project that I call it Chef for Chance. I feel like a chef, if they come by string together, they can, they can cook something more than a good meal, but they can cook a good mission and serve to the society. So we, we start the project from go to the prison to teach the prisoner how to, uh, how to cook. Actually, they really know how to cook. Uh, to teach the, the prisoner about cooking is nothing new. But to go there with the chef and the chef willing to share the recipe, okay? and willing to allow the prisoner, once they get out and they want to set up the food stall and refer to the recipe of each chef, the on chefs are okay to do it. And I think that's a, that's a very unique point of this uh, program. 
because uh, if give a, a faster opportunity for the prisoner if they want to start their own life in uh, in food service they can just start, start right away they can refer to the chef recipe they can go with the core brand with the chef brand so that that's how uh, we start the Chef for Chance, okay? And right after the SB in Jantaboon, it came the pandemic. Okay. I was uh, sitting here in, in this house, okay? And uh, the next day, I have to go back to Bangkok to pick up my daughter who flew from San Francisco. And while I was uh, waiting for her at the airport, I got a phone call. One of my uh, friends called me and say, Nui, I just came back from the hospital. You know how hard they work? The nurse, the doctors, they didn't even have time to find any food to eat. Can you help me? I know you can help me. Can you find me uh, someone, your network to cook the food? And I just say, yes. I can. And I call uh, one of the chefs who uh, belong to the Chef for Chance project. Her name is uh, Jie Zhong. Okay. Jie Zhong is just like a very sweet food, mass uh, food. She uh, sells fried pork. Okay. For the people, like uh, taxi drivers, uh, in a very affordable, reasonable price. So, all of the mass uh, people knew her. I called her and said, Jiechong, can you help me uh, prepare the, your food, a thousand box, to send to the doctors, to the nurse in one hospital? Then Jiechong just say, a thousand? I said, yes, a thousand. And he just say, yes, I can do. But, okay, but Jiechong, I have to tell you that I cannot find any money at this time. So we have to advance our cash for it. And tomorrow I will do the communication. I will announce this project on my Facebook and you can announce it on your Facebook too. But at this time, let's help the healthcare people first. I arranged all of this thing in half an hour. That's beautiful. The next day, she delivered the, the, the a thousand box to the hospital and we showed the picture. Mark, you may not believe it that in that afternoon, people with good hearts came to her shop. Some gave her uh, cash, the money. Some came with the pork. Some came with the eggs. Some came with the rice. It's just very overwhelming. How, how people willing to, to help each other. And after that, we never have to spend any of our own money for this project. We, we earn more than 1.5 million baht for this wow. project. And we can uh, arrange three weeks of the meals for the healthcare officer. And we also gain the collaboration the, the support from other chefs is not only Jiechong, okay? So we have a lot of chefs uh, call and offer that they want to be part of this thing. So this really show that brand can uh, function as a platform for the collaboration. And this is uh, the project that you also should be proud of because you are one of the founder, if you recall the workshop that you helped me conduct. Yes. that we call the, the Chef Manifesto in Chumpon, remember? Yep, I do, I do remember. It was beautiful. So we did, we've done a couple manifestos, Seafood Manifesto, Chef's Manifesto. Um, that is such a beautiful story and I'm glad that that works. I, I know the strength of, of your network, but more so the heart and hospitality of those people who have strong ethics and care about community and about sustainability and how <clears throat> we can show people a different way 
uh, of doing business in a sustainable, resilient and uh, uh, way that, that thinks about environmental social governance, about our world and our people. Um, so I love to hear that type of story. So it's around four o'clock where you're at. It's around 11 o'clock where I'm at. And I hear the beautiful rooster crowing in the background. And <laughs> you, you, you live in, in a beautiful area and you have a beautiful, um, what uh, one of my guests on a previous show said, this beautiful human zoo that we live in. Um, a lot of us now in this lockdown in this pandemic time are are seeing our human zoo much closer than we have ever seen it before for a lot more time. So we're realizing if we did a good job at uh, making it the type of environment or the type of zoo that we can survive in for a long time, uh, or if there's some things that need to change. And so um, this kind of leads in, in, into uh, a different question that, uh, is much bigger on, on our world level, our world zoo, our, our uh, world bank, our home and the world kitchen. Do you feel like uh, with your languages and abilities um, that you're a global citizen? Do you have any thoughts or feelings what it would feel like if nations, borders, walls were broken down and didn't exist anymore in, in, in the future? What, what exactly is your question? So um, another, another thing that you mentioned in your story during the beginning of the pandemic was almost around the same time uh, um, I was just leaving Bangkok to go um, to some other events and uh, go actually to the United States and some other events. And at that time, people in in, in Thailand were already wearing face masks. They'd been do doing it almost, I think it was almost three months prior because the air yeah. pollution yes. was so bad, correct? Yeah, um, for the PM. Yeah, for the PM, for the air pollution. And so when the pandemic hit, it, it wasn't, it was bad, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been because people are already protecting themselves with, with a mask for air pollution. P, uh, the, the, the M, P25 yeah, mask, yeah, M25 mask, yeah. And, um, but at that same time, you were going to go pick up your wonderful daughter who had just finished her degree and it was supposed to be a celebratory time. You didn't get to do that. And you had to then meet her at the airport, which you, you said. And my question now is, what's happened is from the pandemic, we're kind of in a lockdown situation. But as someone who has dealt a lot with Japan, has dealt a lot with uh, the United States, studied in Australia, studied in the US, um, has friends from all different cultures and areas of the world, do you personally feel like you're a global citizen? And if in the future, there were no divisions of nations, borders, and walls. How would you feel? What can you kind of give me a description or feeling if that's reality? If, if you would like to see a world like that. And I oh, actually, just, when when, yeah. when you're talking about the, the global citizen, Mark, I would say uh, yes. I'm one of the global citizen. But I also value the local citizen, okay? Uh, because of the thinking of the, the middle part or I just mentioned to you about the moderation. I think uh, in, in the real life, you really have to balance between global and local, right? So you can have a mindset of the global citizen because uh, in your culture, you probably say that it's about the, the same ecosystem. But in Buddhism, we have a teaching that say that everyone, every single one is the same one. So it's uh, similar to the 
to the oneness theory. Everyone is the same one. Whatever happened to you will affect to other life. Okay. So uh, in a sense, I feel like uh, I'm a global citizen because I'm one of the people that belong to the world, a small part of the world. Okay. But in some uh, context, you still have to feel like uh, you belong to some local or some community because uh, you still have what we call culture, something that gives you a loot, something that makes you feel belong to. Okay, so I think, yes, I'm one of the global citizens, but also. I'm also one of the local population. And I think to, to uh, combine uh, when should be the global citizen, when I should act I, like a local population, I think it's a matter of time and space. I think it's everything, there is no absolute answer. It's all really depend, it's all relative, okay? And if you ask me if I'm one of the global citizens, what should be the, the issue that I concern most? It should be about food. I think uh, people work so hard. People live, people work to get the money for food. Okay. Among all of the SDG, among all of the SD goals, I think food is the foundation of everything. Okay. For sure, yes. Right, so, so for me, uh, one of the global issues that I'm very uh, try to be part of the solution is about food. That's why last uh, SB, I asked you to conduct the workshop called Moonshot to the Organic Food. Yeah, and it was it was absolutely beautiful and had had a great time. So I don't know if you know, but I've kind of been leading you on a way. So yes, I asked you about global citizenry and what your thoughts or feelings are. But I also want to make a, a point because you, you brought it so eloquently. During this lockdown period, what was our global citizen? Our global citizen was food, was our energy source. You said it yourself, Thailand is seen as the kitchen of the world. It is one of the, the number one exporters of food during, during the pandemic. That's the only thing that was moving around our world was food. And uh, it is a global citizen and it is our most vital resource. And so those two tie very much together and you're 100% spot on with this global and local. There's a new term that's uh, developed about five years ago. It's called global. So uh, the global <laughs> and local together. And it's very much this, this uh, holistic view. We are all homo sapiens. We're all connected as distant cousins and uh, related in one way or the other. Um, I must say, I feel very at home at, at Thailand, not only with the food and things, but you can go anywhere in the world and find uh, the Thai food and the rice and the, Im the, the imported goods from Thailand, which is uh, food is that global citizen. Many respects, uh, and you know I'm, I'm writing a book, you also have a wonderful contribution within this book, Menu B. Uh, with, within that, the book and within when I speak about food, I often say that we didn't domesticate food, it domesticated us. So, you know, at the beginnings, we were hunters and gatherers and foragers, and we moved around the world and we went where the fish were and we went where the food was. And then we kind of thought we were domesticating food and started farming and doing some things. But in reality, the food didn't become domesticated, we did. We ended up staying put in these four walls, this human zoo that, that, uh, that I, you know, I was mentioning. And, 
And so it's actually domesticated us and our diets have gotten poorer and the way we eat and the way we do things has kind of gotten more confined uh, and not so much global like it should be. And that brings me to a question and I don't know how much experience or if you can even answer it, but with the Western diet, with highly processed foods that aren't organic that are coming onto the market, um, you've mentioned the, the Buddhist uh, uh, religion or, or, and even your dealings with monks or, or, or the Buddhists there, they're starting to have more diabetes, more overweight, more health problems because of this highly processed beca food, because of the diets are changing a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts and feelings of, of, um, of that? And, and do, you have, do you have anything you can share with us in that respect, what you're seeing? I, I don't know if I'm going to, to answer your question or not, but what I have in mind is uh, when I'm thinking about uh, the food or the, even the future of food, the problems that we people, most of the people, again from food because of the the term process okay i i think the way we treat food right now we treat it without any respect we we don't respect the power of nature that's why i feel like uh, the term organic is very important and when we uh say organic it doesn't only mean uh some food that would be good for your health. Organic means you have to respect to the nature. The nature of the food that we grow, either by the term uh, GI geographic indication, or even your own nature. People in the East and people in the West should consume different things. We don't have to consume the same processed food. Okay, I, I think the way we, we treat our diet, it's this thought, the nature of the, the body, the, the, the whole system. That's why a lot of people get sick because uh, you don't select what you're going to put in your mouth. So I think uh, in the future, if we try to, to make everything more like a, organic and give a real definition of, to the term organic that only not about uh, the food it also about you the the eater i think the the health issue can be decreasing uh, that that's why uh, when actually uh, people in the past we don't even have to say the term organic okay because uh, we never have to fertilize, we never have to uh, give them a tool to come to the term like uh, overproduction. This uh, come from the term greed, right? That you, you want more, you want to control the nature. So the scientific, even the technology, want to control the nature. And this is how the nature teach you. The pandemic is the world lesson. So if you go back and learn to respect the, the power of nature, especially in the food, you will know how to treat the soil. You would know how to treat the ocean, not just about the rice, not just about the fish, but the origin, the resources that provide the food. So that, that is my uh, opinion. I don't know whether I that's answered your question that's or you, not. <laughs> you did answer it, and that's exactly what I wanted to know. And I, I, I really um, I want to know your opinion, your thoughts as someone who is a, is a cultural leader and um, someone who uh, has, has had a lot of thoughts around food and how we produce food. You also, I think, have the largest network of organic farmers uh, under your clients and those who you associate with one way or the other, uh, pretty much almost all the ones and you're constantly trying to find new and also educating to try to get new people to transition into this uh, 
this type of organic agriculture and with diversity and different uh, tools and, and things of, of producing food. Um, that doesn't nicely lead into my next question, but um, the, uh, some of it does, and, and we, we touched on, you touched on it uh, just a little bit. This uh, sufficiency economy philosophy, believe it or not, um, uh, ties extremely well into the sustainable development goals. And I know that you uh, also see the sustainable development goals that all 17 of them are tied to food. 11 of them intrinsically deeply are tied to food. Um, um, but really it also ties to the sufficiency economy philosophy. How, how do you feel uh, Thailand? How do you feel you're going, the companies that you're working with are going towards achieving the sustainable development goals and how their work in progress is, is going? What are your thoughts and feelings now five years into it with 10 years left to go? One thing, one very important thing that I learned from the pandemic is now I only believe in the power of small business, uh, small people, okay? I used to work for a big corporation. I still have a, a big corporation as my clients, but believe me, when it's come to the social change, small people, can do a better job. The better job means uh, they can do faster. They don't have to go to the boardroom to get the approval. Imagine uh, the story about uh, helping the healthcare people deliver the food to them. If I have to go to my uh, big corporation clients, I think the faster we can get the approval could be three days instead of 30 minutes, right? So right now, I really believe in the small people. So I really don't care much about the SDG goal. I don't know uh, how the big corporation will get to that because uh, so far, I haven't seen any big corporation draft or write the business plan that start with the SDG, okay? That's more like uh, the goal of the CSR department. So that is very sad. If they really believe in it, it should be at the top of the corporate strategy and deploy into the business strategy, the brand strategy, operational strategy. But right now, SDG is just like a, something that I need to know because I'm a public company, okay? And, and I don't think that can create that much change. But uh, when I say this, I didn't uh, say that what the big corporation doing now is uh, useless, don't take me wrong, okay? I just say that, uh, consider myself as a small consultant, small people, and if I want to create a real impact right now, I will go to the small business. I will go to my uh, SME clients. I will go to the people that use more of the common sense, not corporate sense. They might even know the term sustainable development. They don't even understand what brand means but they have a heart for people. So they are the, the one who can, for me, create the real impact to the, to the society. So that, that's, that's, how I, that's how I feel towards sustainability. Pandemic, right. give me a hope in the small people. And I can see, I can witness the real change that they already create. To the society. I agree. I, I think uh, you, you, I want to dive deeper into that and unpack it because I think there are some things that might not everyone everyone might not understand, and and maybe I'm not understanding it. So you might need to clear me up. 
Um, I, I think with large corporations, uh, there's not enough on, on board. There, there are some big ones uh, coming on board, especially the beginning of this year was really positive, um, but it's not integrated in their core values and their business plan enough. We both said it uh, earlier that all the sustainable development goals are tied to food. And so um, really, whether someone indigenous or local or small, medium organization or person, the small individual, knows it or not that the sustainable development goals aren't for big countries, they're not for corporations, they're not for cities, they're for us because they're all tied to food and they're for us as an individual and they're to be seen like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our basic needs of resources, breathing food, water, food, security, shelter, security of body, security of resources. It's our basic needs and most people don't understand that. That, that brings me to what you mentioned several times about the, the SMEs, the small, medium enterprises, organizations, uh, the individual, the small individuals. One thing that's very difficult that they don't realize is these big corporations, the big food producers, the big, the big whoever, they're actually big, but they're the minority in our world. The majority is small, medium enterprises have the biggest piece of the pie, the biggest piece of the cake and uh, have the biggest touch points to all the individuals and in many respects, whether it's Ikea or a Unilever or someone else, they go get their raw goods and their resources from many small individual, uh, small medium enterprises, organizations out there. And um, if we realize that true strength and empowerment that we actually hold the bigger piece of the pie and we unify locally as, uh, as a force in food and in the sustainable development goals, our impact uh, is enormous. What we can do not only in times of need to restore the communities, to restore and help and, and resiliently bounce back, that is uh, unbelievable and it's been shown and tried and proven time and time again. So in that respect, I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely with you. I deal with the sustainable development goals in a lot of different areas. Philippines is another area where people are so impoverished that, and so they're thinking about their basic needs. They have no clue what some shiny sustainable development goals are, um, but they have a better understanding of them because they use the sufficiency uh, economy philosophy they use, another uh, philosophy of the way they treat their locals, their friends and, and support and help each other, that in other ways they are implementing them and using them to the best knowledge possible. I guess for me to come in to the Sustainable Brands event or come to Thailand for you is, um, and I want you to answer this as what your thoughts and reasons are. My, my views and feelings why, why you had me come is to bring the bottom up approach to every individual to show them that, that every individual has the opportunity to, to innovate, to do things differently, to do things organically, to think and look at food in a different way, to reduce food waste, that it doesn't have to be this crazy thing that's unreachable, but that every individual can do it because it's something we do anyway. We, we all hopefully eat every day and that's the biggest way to impact. And, and there's probably some other reasons why as well, but I'd love to hear your thoughts and feelings on why, why you've, ha you've had me come to Thailand to try to help the locals and to speak to people um, uh, to move them forward in, in a different direction because the direction is the direction of the sustainability development goals of the sufficiency economy philosophy. Um, and so I'd like to hear your thoughts or views. I think you, you uh, uh, wrap it up and lead it to the very good point. Um, 
to, to get into the sustainability uh, SDG, any goals, at the end of the day, it's all about people. Either people at the bottom or people at the top, right? Uh, even if you are in the big corporation, but people in the top never believe in it. They never value the triple bottom line. They still only see the, the profit and keep saying business sustainability, that's mean profit forever. You cannot change anything. Okay, so everything go down to the term, to the word people. People has to be the one who, who change. I try to change the people at the top from working with a big corporation, okay? And in the big corporation, the issue is uh, every time when they change the, the leader, if the brand is not solid or strong enough, the, the vision of the corporation change accordingly, okay? But if I work with the people at the bottom, either they are the SME, either they are the startup, either they are the consumer within my circle, or even they are the community. I just see more opportunity to, uh, to help them to be the, the driving force for change. Okay, that, that's uh, probably how I see it. And that's uh, one of my, my goal to working on the sustainability. And in Thailand, in order to, to move people to get to the point of sustainability, which means we have to value other life, we have to understand the term inclusiveness, right? That uh, you are not the only species, that uh, if you survive because you are the strongest, but if you are the strongest and you are the best, you have to carry other life along with you to make people understand the term inclusiveness or caring, sharing to other life. I think the, the philosophy of sufficiency is a tool, it's a right tool, it's a right mindset to make uh, Thai people, at least uh, people in my uh, circle, understand the value of sharing. Because uh, my king always said that it doesn't matter that Thailand has to be the tiger or one of the best country in Asia. The most important thing for his task is to make sure that every single Thai has enough to survive. Have enough to survive doesn't mean equally. It doesn't mean equal. Everyone has a, a different share, different uh, uh, section but they should have like uh, enough according to, to their life. So uh, when I use the term uh, moderation or the middle part, and I teach them that I never stop that when we say that we have to walk slow, it doesn't mean that you have to stop, but you have to walk slow enough so you can bring another people to walk along with you. But if you just run or you rush to the, to the top, you're probably there alone. So if you slow down a bit, you can include other people to join the journey. And you can make sure that no matter what happened in that journey, you have a network, you have the people to support you. So, uh, for me, I think the sufficiency philosophy is more like a means for sustainability. Because uh, when we talk about sustainability, sustainable development, people always uh, ask how, how we can do it. But in, in my uh, circle 
or in my belief, I use the sufficiency as a tool to take the business, to take my clients into the journey towards sustainability. It's also um, a, a model and a philosophy that is very cultural. That's the one that comes from King Ram the Ninth and has been very, most people know about it most. Uh, so, and, and it's, it, it really is very tied into and fitting towards the sustainability in general, but also the sustainable development goals. So it, it fits hand in hand. And I drew, truly believe that local regional aspect of how we apply it as where we need to go. We need to apply to the culture in those areas. I have one of the hardest questions that I ask all my guests that I'm going to ask you next, and that is the burning question, WTF, which is not the swear word, but what's the future? And I, I want to know what's the future for Nui um, and what your thoughts on the future are. I think the future is um, uncertainty, right? <laughs> as, a, as a Buddhism, we just say that if you make the present right, you don't have to worry too much about the future. The future is the karma of today, okay? So uh, the minute that you understand your meaning of life, that you were born not for yourself, but you were born to create value to other lives, and you know how to do it. For me, I don't have to worry about my future. As long as uh, my life right now, I live my life uh, with the philosophy or with the belief of three M's, okay? No matter the future will come, I will live my life with moderation, which means the, the wisdom of balancing between me, myself, and other life. The second M is uh, mindful. Okay, I, I, before I make any decision, I have to think through. I have to be conscious about the, the impact, about the, the karma. That's why in addition to my talk on the sufficiency economy, I always has a talk on the karma marketing because uh, there's something that can either create a positive footprint or positive footprint. Karma is a footprint, right? So I always mindful. I always think about if I do this, what's going to be uh, the impact, not just the outcome, what's going to be the impact of my action? And the last one, whatever I do, I have to make sure that it's meaningful. Because uh, if there is no use, if they cannot be uh, beneficial to our life, it's just the action. So, uh, if you want to have a future with the immunity, with the surround by love and support, I think by uh, living today with three M's, I think my future would be fine. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it would be as well. And I've heard, heard you talk about this before and it's absolutely beautiful. The, um, Karma is a footprint is a very powerful statement. It is oh so true and uh, ties into a lot of other things that we're experiencing in our world with uh, Earth Overshoot Day and, and a global footprint and things like that. During this pandemic, this lockdown where we had this pause, we actually through the global footprint, uh, the Earth Overshoot Day, was uh, July 29th last year and this year it's August 22nd so we gained 24 more days but I have to caveat that it was very positive for some time and now we're getting all sorts of reports that uh, since June the um, 
Antarctic and uh, Siberia and, and uh, Canada, um, glacial sheets are, are melting and breaking off. And we've got huge forest fires that are in the Northern hemisphere where it's normally pretty cold, where there's a permafrost. And, and um, I, I, because of a forced pause, because of the COVID, I think it, it's nice because there are some benefits that could that kind of came out off of a bad situation, but it's not enough to set our planet back into alignment of, of our planetary boundaries and fix things. And so um, there are some 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 disheartening things coming that are all pointing to that each individual, like you just mentioned needs to uh, live this sufficiency economy philosophy live the the three m's and and kind of look how they can live in harmony with uh, uh, people planet and our environment and and that uh, it's really important that we live within these planetary boundaries that leads me to my last hardest question <laughs> which is probably similar to what you've already answered before, but it's a little bit of a twist because I ask you to take this global perspective um, uh, and answer the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I think uh, the world that show more respect to the nature okay because uh if uh, we believe that the world is also the living thing the world has life okay it's not just uh, the the place that uh, we go and say in people will never be important or greater than nature so I think uh, once the people start to, to treat nature well, the nature will treat you well. I think what's uh, really happening right now is the karma that people give to the world. And now it just uh, come back to everyone. Okay. So uh, my future world is uh, actually when people uh, were locked up at home and you say that uh, some people even experience the animal zoo. I think it's the best time for every single soul to appreciate the nature. I walk around my house almost every morning during the pandemic. I look at the tree, I look at the plants, and I start to, to uh, realize the importance of the, the plant, the tree, that I never give important. I just feel like uh, they were born for me because uh, when I was born, the tree is everywhere around me, okay? But when you have time with yourself and you start to uh, walk around and appreciate the coexist of everything. I think uh, if we really value the term coexist, we know that people is just a small part of the universe. And we shouldn't try to, to overcome or win over the nature. We should learn to respect the nature. We should learn how to nurture the nature, and then we will have the, the future for our next generation. That, that's how I uh, see the world in the future. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Noe. And, and uh, I, I know you and, um, are connected, very connected to nature. I mean, even in our podcast, I don't know if those who are listening or who can watch the video, they will hear the rooster crowing and the birds chirping and they'll see the bugs flying around and hear the, the wind uh, breezing a little bit. 
you are very close to nature. You try to ground yourself and, and not only the way you think in your philosophies, but also with nature. And I believe that is uh, one of the most healing things anyone can do wherever they are in the world is to get out and look at trees, take a walk and enjoy things that maybe you haven't seen or realized before. Um, now that you have the opportunity and if you don't feel like you're forced with this opportunity that you should definitely take the opportunity to see things that you've maybe never seen before and enjoy them and understand them. I always say, um, uh, and I have for a long time, it comes from Lynn Margulis that this uh, symbiotic earth, that homo sapiens truly need to become an integral part of this symbiotic earth. Uh, I was in Songdo, Korea in um, 2019, yeah, or it was 2019 for the Resilience Frontiers. And there was a Professor Chin there and he spoke that not only we need to become part of the symbiotic earth, but Homo sapiens actually need to start to evolve a little bit more to be part of this, uh, what we could call a homo symbios, a new evolution of homo sapiens that really see themselves as an integral part of nature and our environment, our world with all other species of our world. I, I really believe that is a big way to connect and ground yourself and to live a long and healthy life if you have the, that, that connection. Um, I, I want to ask you for something. I, I'm pretty sure you'll give it because you're a giving person, but I want a, a valuable, sustainable takeaway for all my listeners, whether they're designers, branders, marketers, advertisers, innovators, organic farmers, that you can give them some kind of a wisdom, a tool, a sustainable takeaway from Nui and your years of experience and wisdom that you say, if I could give you this one tool or this message, this is what I'd like to give you because it will empower you, it'll make you better, or it's just some good wisdom to live by. I'm going to ask you to maybe depart that free gift to all my listeners um, before we say goodbye today. Well, actually, uh, the three M's would be the thing I would love to, to share to the people who have the same belief that life has to be coexist with other life. Okay, no matter what you do, you're going to build a brand you're going to uh, create the social innovation. You're going to do anything. Do it in the sense of moderation, which means that it has to be in the middle part that provide benefit for the society and also for the commercial or the business whatsoever. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, everything should be about people everything should answer to the common good all right so moderation we will give you the good sense of practicality a good sense of how you're going to use the resources either in terms of natural resources or financial resources whatsoever you will do it with a sense of moderation which doesn't mean in the not like a not up to the top quality you still can do it in a very high quality I but in the that. sense of balancing okay and uh, the second one is uh, mindful okay to be mindful i think it's very important otherwise uh, people won't try to practice the meditation okay to be mindful is mean that you stop to think and you think through. There are many times that people try to compete with the speed. They try to uh, go fast. You try to be the, the number one in the competition and you forget about other people. So to be mindful is like a 
you you think through uh, you go through the thinking process and the last one which for me is very important and could be the most important element of living is uh, live your life in the meaningful way okay there is no uh, I think to, to, to be the meaningful is, uh, doesn't mean have to be like a big KPI. If you do something that really means create impact to other people, either small group, two or three people, it means that your action is, uh, is value, okay? So uh, to live a meaningful life, it means that you have a purpose of living. And I think that's uh, very important because uh, otherwise, how could you compete with the AI? How could you compete with the technology? So on of this 3M, we give uh, the power back to the mankind. So I think for me, the 3M is very important for the last M, the mankind. Great. That's so wonderful. Thank you very much. And earlier in our talk, when, when in our discussion, when you mentioned um, the three M's, you also, uh, and probably also earlier with the sufficiency economy philosophy, you mentioned survival of the fittest and competition. You also mentioned it just now, this competition. Um, there's this thing called neo-Darwinism, neoliberalism, and what that is is this thought of competition that only the strong survive, only the uh, survival of the fittest, only competition. Um, I, I hate to swear, but it's bullshit. It doesn't exist. Uh, neo-Darwinism doesn't exist. Neoliberalism doesn't exist. There is no such thing as natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. That does not exist. That's not how nature works. That's not how a symbiotic earth works. That's not how um, our world works. Um, uh, that was uh, something that came up much later and was twisted, um, but that's not reality. We need to live in harmony, in cooperation, in symbios with our earth and our planet. And that is the true way to be not only successful, but also to be live a long life, to be sustainable, to be sufficient, to be around for multiple generations, to, to nurture our world and live within planetary boundaries. Nui, I love you and I thank you so much for your time and that you took it out to be on the show and I look forward to seeing you soon at another event or another time where we can break bread together, show com compassion to one another uh, through food and through good conversation. And uh, um, uh, you're welcome anytime here in, in Hamburg, Germany. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much for being on the show. Send love to everyone. I will, I will. Thank you so much, Nui. Take care.